Okay. So the first iconic American company we have is the New York Times. And I have the pleasure of inviting to the stage Mark Thompson, the CEO of New York Times. Mark, please come up on stage. Hey, Mark. Good to see you. Yeah, exciting to talk about 5G. I am. We're, we're, we're now going to move from uh, Swedish English to British English without latency. Uh, um. <laughs> <It's a> seamless <laughs> translation. <laughs> so, Hans, thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to, to join you up here to talk about our share plans for 5G this year. Now, pretty much every company nowadays claims they're in the, in the business of storytelling. But in the case of the New York Times, it's actually true. Um, the Times exists to tell stories, to tell the stories the world wants and needs to hear. Once, as you all know, we did it just with paper and ink. But today, we try and use every new digital advance, every new display, new device, new piece of functionality to bring our stories to life, which is why we pioneer the use of VR, AR, and smartphone infographics for serious journalism. From The New York Times, I'm Michael Barbaro. This is The Daily. And yes, it's why we launched The Daily, which now brings Times journalism to more than 8 million listeners a month, nearly half under 30. It was Apple's most downloaded podcast in 2018. It's why we're about to launch our first major TV show, The Weekly, on cable and OTT. And it's also why we're so excited about the storytelling potential of 5G and about the collaboration we're announcing today between The Times and Verizon. This January, with Verizon's support, we're launching a new journalism 5G lab at The Times. Now, this lab's going to be based in our main newsroom, and it'll work very closely with Times journalists in New York City, across America, and around the world. It'll partner with Verizon's Open Innovation Group and get early access to 5G technology and equipment. And we'll use those resources to experiment not just in lab conditions, but in the field with real reporters and live news. We believe that the speed and la lack of latency of 5G can spark a revolution in digital journalism in two ways. First, by transforming the way our journalists gather the news, allowing them to capture richer, more immersive media, and to deliver their stories with much greater immediacy. And second, by bringing that richer, more immediate journalism to audiences instantaneously and in the form that they want and need it. Previous revolutions in mobile networks and devices have led to many unexpected, sometimes counterintuitive breakthroughs, and 5G will be no exception. That's why The Times and Verizon have opted for the lab and the path of experimentation. So in a way, the full fruits of this collaboration are going to have to wait for next year's CES. But let me give you a flavor of what we hope to achieve using some stories we published this past fall in the 4G era. With this piece showing the aftermath of the wildfires in California, you can see how we already strive to weave text, aerial and ground photo, video and AR together to put the user into the heart of the story. 5G should enable us to take this kind of multimedia storytelling to the next level. And remember that while this piece took many, many hours of painstaking graphics production in New York, we're aiming to deliver incredibly rich 5G journalism from the field as the news happens. So that's the first game we're hoping to make, immediacy. Fast reactions are critical in classical breaking news scenarios, but speed is important to pretty much every story and opinion piece we publish. Now, 5G should also enable us to bring rich multimedia to many more of our stories. More photos, more graphics, more video, more AR and VR, more sound, and more innovation within each of those media. The best journalism has always tried to give the reader the sensation of witnessing the news themselves, of being as close to the story as the reporter. 5G should bring that ambition a big step closer to reality. The lab will also combine 5G technology with machine learning to optimize story order and the expression of the stories themselves to match the preferences and needs of individual end users. Location, time of day, mood state and prior consumption can all be used to make the experience more relevant and valuable, potentially with much of this personal data remaining securely on the user's device rather than disappearing who knows where. 
Times users tell us they never want us to hand over ultimate editorial choices to machines. But we recognize that 5G devices will be the most personal devices ever created. This new lab and our new partnership with Verizon should enable us to discover how to harness the personal power of 5G for news. And finally, once widely adopted, 5G should also transform the potential for citizen journalism and the crowdsourced reporting of news. The new lab will help us to unlock that potential and to solve the challenges of verification and authenticity that have dogged user-generated content in the past. So as you can hear, we believe we're at the start of something really big, the next chapter in the story of quality digital news. And as we set out on this new journalistic adventure, I can't think of any company we'd rather be partnering with than Verizon. So thank you, Hans, for the chance to join you up here on stage today, and thanks to all of you for listening. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, uh, even a small increase in risk would have a serious public health impact. And in the meantime, rather than telling people, if you are concerned, this is what you can do, the health agencies need to promote precautionary measures especially for children and women, because in children, the risks could be greater due to the increased penetration, as well as the sensitivity of the developing brain to uh, da tissue-damaging agents. So finally, what is the lesson learned? We should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing, because to not do so is not ethical. Any. So there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here, so far as health and safety is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the most important study is a study by the National Toxicology Program. In a classic, large carcinogenicity test, one of the largest ever performed, and for that matter, one of the most expensive, they found increased risk of the tumors, which we believe radiofrequency radiation is causing in man. Uh, particular tumors called schwannomas. In the rats, they were in the heart. In, in humans, they're often in the nerve, the ear nerve, the vestibular nerve. At this point, the evidence has become sufficiently strong that cell phone radiation is a human carcinogen. A major development from California's Department of Public Health, high use of cell phones may be linked to certain types of cancer and other health effects, including brain cancer and tumors, lower sperm counts, headaches, and effects on learning, memory, hearing, behavior, and sleep. If it was a real problem, I would know. If it was a real problem, the government would protect us. How come I'm not hearing about this? Like, they're all things I've heard when I give seminars. You know, I get up there and they say, oh yeah, if this was really a problem, they would have told us. I am they. I am a, you know, legitimate scientist and I am telling you.